You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup-Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Rysomczynski and I, Niels Kostrup-Larsen, where each week... We take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to motivate and inspire you to continue your rules-based investing journey. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your appetite to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Moritz where we had a good discussion about a really important part of what we as managers do, which is often overlooked, by the way, and that is what to do with all the cash we don't post as margin for our trading. And I shared some really key insights that I had received from our cash manager at Don uh, named Halliard Asset Management, which I hope you will go back and listen to. Mark, great to be back with you this week. How are you doing? How are things shaping out where you are? Good. Um, it's uh, good to talk to you again. It's uh, It's been a short time since the last I time know. we talked. So, so we usually do it about a month. So very much uh, focused in on March Madness. Is, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if your European audiences are excited about uh, college basketball, but in the U.S., this is, this is a premier sports event. My uh, school won last uh, yesterday, so so I'm very happy. So as they move forward, so but but it's exciting for basketball and I think for amateur sports. If you if you call college athletics amateur sports, <laughs> exactly. I think that that is a an important uh, point. I think over here maybe uh, we've changed the definition a little bit of March Madness. Last year it was the fastest uh, sell off in equities ever seen. And this year, it seems to be a little bit of madness going on with vaccines, some of them uh, creating uh, blood cloth and all of that good stuff. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here in Europe still. So yeah, that 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 is an interesting point is as you go back, when people think of March Madness, <laughs> they, they're thinking of the sell-off of last year. They do, they're not thinking college basketball. So one hopes that this March Madness will be much calmer and you can watch from your sofa or your chair as opposed to from the, the edge of your seat. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. Now, before I jump into my normal weekly market wrap, I do want to mention a great tweet that Jerry did yesterday. He wrote, almost everything I've learned about trading in the past 37 years has affirmed and brought me back to the first thing I learned. And then Mikhailo from Russia replied, and I thought there was a great reply. I think that's because your teacher was Richard Dennis. And I think that was a great, great reply. So so well done to, to both of you. Now, in terms of a market wrap, the main event of the past week was, of course, Powell's post-FOMC press conference on Wednesday. Given the continued rise in long-term maturity rates and the continued drop in treasury bills rates, investors speculated that the chairman would address both issues. Specifically, speculation was rife that he would announce an extension in the Supplementary leverage ratio, the SLR, which excludes treasury holdings from the leverage calculation of banks. Instead, when he was asked about it by a reporter, he said they expected to have an answer in the coming days. And true to his word, the central bank did announce on Friday that they would not extend the temporary measure. This decision may well negatively impact the overall appetite for treasury paper at a time when the bond is in a bear market now. And the two-year, 30-year spread is closing the week at 230 basis points, 75 basis points wider than it was at the beginning of this year. Also of note this week, the free money stimulus checks have begun to arrive in recipient bank accounts, which has caused the yield on treasury bills to crash with bills yielding now below 0% all the way out to the end of Q2 of this year. Next week, we have a number of Fed officials speaking, as well as the release of the February US PCE inflation data. So no doubt, it'll be another interesting week in the markets. Now, Mark, before um, I uh, go to kind of what happened on our side this week, what I know, and yes, you said it's only been, a, a, I think, a couple of weeks since we last spoke or three weeks, but 
Is there anything that's caught your attention since we last spoke? Could be in the markets, could be some research before we jump into some specific points later, just overall? Well, I think overall is this is that I think that, again, uh, we found out that this is a Fed central bank driven environment as opposed to a real economic environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but everybody was on the edge of their seat uh, for what Powell said. Everyone's focused in on what central banks do, whether it's the Bank of Japan, which they widen their uh, yield curve controls, what the ECB may or may not do, given what the U.S. is doing, is this is that generally you'd love to have an economy that's driven by their real numbers as opposed to personality. And yet now, again, we're, we're focused in on personality and we're reading tea leaves of what is forward guidance. So the whole objective of monetary policy post great financial crisis, one of the key objectives was that we're going to provide forward guidance so that we could be able to affect expectations. And this forward guidance is going to reduce uncertainty and reduce volatility. And the question you have to ask is after listening to Chairman Powell or listening to a number of central banks, are you given the forward guidance that will reduce uncertainty or has uncertainty actually increased? And I'd say generally people are more sometimes more scratching their head as opposed to saying, okay, now I have clarity on what's going to happen. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Okay, so let me give a quick update on what's going on on our side at Don, but also in my trend following model portfolio. So on our side this week, performance was pretty much centered around one sector, and that was energies. On Thursday, energy markets tanked, literally, on concerns about higher yields following the FOMC meeting, some weaker short-term fundamentals following the release of the latest IEA report that did not see any super cycle coming in oil markets in the near future, as well as a lack of new long positions held by money managers, the so-called speculative positions. Most other sectors really within our trend following program were pretty much flat this week. And so the correction we saw overall was also, by the way, confirmed by my trend barometer, which dropped to a level of 45 as of last night, Friday night, which is a pretty neutral level for that. Overall risk targeting on our side in our trend portfolio has remained pretty much unchanged the last week or so. On the volatility strategy that we run, it was a profitable week and mainly driven by relative developments of the S&P 500 versus the VIX as both declined simultaneously, which is a rather rare combination. But overall, it was a rather calm week from a trading perspective and the strategy finished up just shy of 1% for the week. Overall exposure increased a little bit during the week to a yeah, relatively high level overall. And as some of you may have noticed, the S&P 500 made a new all-time high on Wednesday. And as my colleagues in our volatility team mentioned to me, if you look back in history until recently, at least last time the S&P index made new highs and the VIX was above 20 was during the internet bubble in 1999-2000. And while we did see even higher VIX levels during last year's equity market all-time highs, the current VIX level remains Highly unusual in comparison to the last two decades. Overall, the VIX is still above historical averages, but at 20, there's still a long way up to the highs we saw last week, which was around 85 in mid-December 2020. My trend-following model, which is where I can go a little bit into more details, it was unchanged for the week, which is, I think, is pretty good. Maybe also a little bit surprising result, even for me. So up month to date 3%, 3.01, and up 8.38% for the year. Performance was pretty evenly spread between all three groups of models, although group three, which are the fast reacting models, did best, best up 1.38%. Group two, which are more the quote-unquote discretionary type models, up 1.08, and the classical trend following models are up half a percent for the month. In terms of sector attribution, equities is doing best, followed by bonds, and FX and base metals are tied for third position, and the worst sector this month is energy and softs, which are down slightly. If we drill down to single markets, DAX and US 10-year notes are doing great, and Canadian dollar also doing well, topping out the top three. 
And markets at the bottom of the table is copper, German Bund, and lead. And in terms of trading this week, it was pretty quiet. The model did a little bit of buying in the SMI and palladium. And then on Thursday, it went and sold a lot of its energy positions as well as some wheat. To give you an idea of the risk, how that is evolving, I use this risk to stop measure, meaning if all positions get stopped out on Monday, then it would lose 9.96%, and that's down from 11.11% last week, probably due to all the exits of some of the positions in the last couple of days. All in all, the system or the model system did about 15 to 20 trades for the week. Now, Mark, before we move on to the question that came in from Mike and Andy, a few, I think maybe we had also a question from Craig. Yeah. I just wanted to um, see if there was any particular point you wanted to um, start out with since we are going to talk about some of the topics. Now, I can, of course, uh, tell the audience that the first topic you mentioned to me has a great headline, which is, is holding bonds stupid? Which, relative to our previous comments uh, at the top of this episode, is a good question. So, um, what's on your mind? <laughs> well, we can start out with that because I think that if you're trading or even if you're following news reports, I think looking at what's happening to yields is probably on the top of everyone's mind. This was a comment that uh, Ray Dalio said in one of his reports. It's uh, available. I think you could get it on LinkedIn, but he said that, you know, you'd have to be almost stupid to hold bonds. And in the current environment, uh, you know, yeah, it's hard to argue with him <laughs> and saying right. that that you shouldn't hold bonds. You look at where bonds are right now, and and you look at the increase that we've seen. We've gone from probably the August to about a half a percent up to about one point seven four percent. And we were having this discussion before uh, we joined the audiences. This is that this this is a uh, a big move, but if you go back in decades on the absolute increase in basis points, it's not that big. It's above the median, but it's not, you know, significant. But on the other hand, on a percentage basis, which you brought up to me, is that that is a really big move. You're going from a half percent to 1.75. Is that on a percentage from the base? That's that's a huge move. Yeah, it's actually, I think, the biggest on record, right? Because I think historically, and, and why this is interesting a little bit to me is that when you go back in time and you look at equity crashes, what you often see is that they are all preceded by rise in interest rates. So, of course, the question is, you know, how severe is this rise in interest rates, right? And as you say, in absolute terms, it's not too bad. But when you turn it into percentages, I think usually you've seen rates rise by about 50, 60 percent. So from, for example, they say from two to three percent in the long end or whatever it might be, right? But this one from half a percent to 1.75 from the 10 year, I mean, that's a huge percentage change. And of course, the people who are in the camp where that the bull market is coming to an end and, and it's looking tired and all of that will pull out statistics like this and say, well, be aware because when we have seen in the past interest rates rise by a big percentage, then it often has led to a big sell-off or crash or bear market or crisis, whatever we call it in the equity market. So I think it's a discussion that's relevant and, and it's not going to go away anytime soon, I think. Well, you, you look at, uh, some would call it bond vigilantes, but if you look at what the bond market is telling or what, what it is discounting versus what Paul is looking at and what we've seen in the SEP forecast, it's a very different world. In a Fed world, they're saying, is that, well, we're going to have... Uh, when you look at it, it's perhaps six and a half percent increase in gro growth, huge numbers for 2021. Then it's going to be a little bit higher in, in 2022, and then it's going to go back to long term growth by 2023. So you have this huge spike, an overshoot in growth, and then it's going to sort of come back, come back down. We're going to have a spike in inflation, and it's going to be the PCE is going to be two and a half percent by the end of the year. And then it's going to come back down and, and, and everything's going to be fine. And we're going to glide path into 2% once again. And, you know, the, the markets are, are say, saying is that, well, not exactly. If you look at five-year break-evens, the uh, five-year break-even in inflation rate would suggest that we're going to be at the highest level since the great, uh, since before the great financial crisis. If you look at 10 years, 
it's a more modest increase, but clearly everyone is suggesting that we're going to have a higher spike in inflation. Now, what makes a market is this is that there could be a lot of different views, but we're at, at a significant disconnect between what the Fed is saying, what they're sort of saying is that how they believe the world will operate and what we're seeing and what the market has. And I think that that's probably one of the uh, key issues that maybe you could just explore a little bit is this is that uh, I go back to my graduate school days and and back in the 80s is that we spent a lot of time even in our macro courses on optimal control theory so we were fine going to be engineers economic engineers on the macro side and if we have all the levers we know the economy we could use optimal control procedures we could use optimization to you know figure out what is the appropriate rate of interest that we could use to be able to sort of get the right growth rate. We, it, it was an engineering problem. And in reality, that's not the way the world actually operates. The op- world operates in a, in a different way, in ways that are surprising. And we're not, or we can't think of ourselves, if you're a policymaker, as engineers. You have to think of yourself as someone who's dealing in a complex world as opposed to a uh, complicated world. Right, which we'll, I think, also touch on later. But but let me just stick with this a little bit further. So what surprises me about this is Powell paints a picture of a really strong economy coming, right? Six and a half, seven, whatever the number was. I did hear it. I've forgotten it again. But it's like a really big number in terms of GDP growth. I also thought he, as from memory, and I could be wrong, but I think he did predict that uh, unemployment rate would drop to 4.5% at the end of the year, and so on and so forth, as, as you rightly say, also very strong growth next year. How does he square that out with keeping rates unchanged at pretty much zero for the next, I don't know, year, two years? That I don't understand. I mean, does he think we're, I mean, it makes no sense to me. So that's my first point. That I, the other thing I just want to say about that, and that is, you're right that things are more complicated and maybe you can't just sit and engineer exactly how you want your recovery to work. We know that. I mean, there's always going to be something that changes the the outlook. And we've seen Powell, you know, obviously the Powell pivot back in 2018 where he went from predicting lower, um, higher rates and then suddenly he turned and went uh, for lower rates. Having said all of that, Have you ever looked at, I mean, and I don't know if this is something that has changed a lot recently, meaning in financial history, but social mood, I mean, for example, you don't really need inflation for inflation to be an issue. You need need expectation of inflation to change, and then it can become an issue really quick. Also, I don't buy into this thing about that they can control, they can run it hot, but I don't think they can just turn it off again when, when, when that happens. But social mood to me is also very interesting. And of course, trend following, a lot of people would say, well, it's kind of based on you know human behavior and all of that stuff. So social mood, I think it's hard to model to some extent, but I think it makes a difference in how we act, how we behave, buying patterns, saving patterns, all of those things, not least also in terms of how social unrest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things, I'm not, I mean, I don't think any politicians are, I mean, they may be thinking about it. They're certainly not talking about it. Well, the problem when we go back to when we started the conversation about being an engineer, is that how do you engineer expectations or how do you, uh, how do you control those expectations? And one of the, the key themes in monetary policy over the last two decades has been the anchoring of expectations of low inflation. And in some senses, that if you go back to the 70s and 80s, we had relatively high expectations for inflation. They were anchored at higher levels. So what the Fed had to do was to raise rates, control money to try to break those inflationary expectations. And they were successful at doing it. And now what they're, what they're saying is that, well, we have the problem now. The opposite problem is, is that they're anchored at too low a level. We've done too good a job of inflation targeting. And so that in some sense, running the economy hot, talking about average inflationary expectations uh, or the average inflation is to break this anchoring of 
low expectations for inflation. But when you think about it, that this is a very difficult problem because you can't just dial this up or down. You can't you can't engineer expectations, or at least I think it's more difficult than what policymakers may think. Yeah, and, and this is why I'm still so much after 30 plus years, so much in love with trend following as a strategy, because I think this is where we adapt uh, well to changes that other strategies don't adapt well to, because we don't really look at it other than we look at what's happening in, in the price. We're not making any predictions. But this, and I don't know if what you're saying also is that it's part of creating this normalcy bias that when things occur, people will say, oh, that's just normal. I mean, just a couple of examples, and I don't make, don't want to make them political in any way, shape, or form, but, but, but here's a couple of things, right? One, it's all become much more normal now a days, given what COVID has done, is that we all run around with masks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost going to be, it's almost, it almost feels now unnatural to not wear a mask. And certainly people will point it out if you're in the public domain and you should be wearing a mask and, and so on and so forth. So the way we think about masks, I mean, I you used to travel to, back when we could travel, I used to travel to to Asia uh, once a year and 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 over there, of course, I kind of thought, oh, that's funny. They wear masks all the time. It's bloody hot anyway. So why are they doing that? But now we're all doing it. So now it seems more normal. The other thing I thought was really interesting, and this is completely off script, so to speak, but I was listening to um, another podcast where they talked about the whole China-Taiwan issue. And of course, as we know, and as, as is being reported, China has basically been flying over Taiwanese airspace for quite a while. And I think now they're doing it with fighter jets or whatever as well. And so what this ex-military guy was saying is what they're doing is they're creating a normalcy bias because people in Taiwan now think, oh, that's normal. They're just flying over Taiwan. It's not a big deal. But the day they decide that they want to make a use case out of that, so to speak. And again, I won't go into further details about that. Then that might buy them one, two, three minutes because before people realize that, oh, this time it's different, that might be enough for them to get an advantage. And it's kind of the same thing in what's going on in the financial world. I mean, some of these things are becoming quote unquote normal, even if we took a, but if we took a step back, and we look at what's going on, if we look at the volume of penny stock trading compared to what it normally is, if we look at now these SPAC companies being IPO'd, which in the old days or in the tech bubble were called like pre-idea companies, which was crazy. I mean, you gave money to people who didn't even have the idea yet. It's kind of the same with the SPAC. You know, they, you give them the money and then they find out what they're going to do with it. What is going on right now in so many ways is crazy. But I think it will have a huge effect once human behavior goes back to normalcy. Well, this is often when we talked about, you talk about uh, behavioral biases and they talk about anchoring. So expectations can be anchored over, over, over what is happening more recent. So I think one of the most important parts of being a good trend follower, a good trader in general, is having a sense of history so that you could be able to weigh the past with the current. And I think that when we had uh, talked about uh, in the last great financial crisis, everyone talked about Minsky moments. And when you talk about a Minsky idea of the world is, is, is that there, as volatility gets lower and lower, there could be a level of complacency from traders that low volatility is the norm. Then when you have a disturbance of low volatility because you're used to it. You were levered up because you, you could leverage up because volatility was lower. Then you get completely surprised by, by the event because it may go back to more historic norms or it just goes back to levels that we may have seen in the past. You're not prepared for it. And so when you think about all of trading, all of trading is, is ultimately about surprise well, perceived surprised events this is that you were used to a certain norm and then all of a sudden we go to a different equilibrium or we go to a different norm or we have a transition and that transition causes uncertainty, that transition causes volatility 
that transition causes trend, and those are where the opportunities are. And when you think about a trend follower versus, let's say, a uh, quantum mental or a more s- different type of trader, a trend follower will sort of say, okay, I'm seeing a change in the environment. I don't know what is going on. All I know is that prices are moving up or down, and I'm going to react to that. The fundamentalist would say, I see a change in the environment. Prices are going up. Well, but this seems to be abnormal. They probably will mean revert because the normal is where I put more emphasis on. Or they could sort of say, well, I need to have more information before I determine whether there's been a change in the environment. So it's different ways of adjusting to abnormality or to change. A trend follower will say, I'm not going to ask for the explanation. I'm just going to react to the price. The fundamentalist said, I see the price. Now I'm going to try to look for a rationalization for what may be happening. Yeah. And the another thing that when you, as I hear you talk, another thing that I just thought of, which is also where I really see a lot of dangers in terms of what we now perceive as normal, is just a correlation between equities and bonds, right? Because the, the beautiful beautiful 60-40 portfolio, especially if you kind of do risk risk parity and you lever up your bonds and all of that. It has worked so well for the last 20 years. People think, oh yeah, bonds will always be there to save the equity part. And, and so this majority of negative correlation we've seen in the last 20 years has just worked so well. But I was watching some charts where you looked at a risk parity stock and bond portfolio over the last 100 years or so, and you get absolutely devastating returns for quite a long period of time during the late 60s and the 70s. And all I can say, or at least this is my 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 gut feel, is that once these things go back to normal behavior and they become more often than not positively correlated, which is, I think, a fair expectation when you look at where interest rates have been and are and where they might go, the whole system and I'll bring up another point, but the whole system, especially institutional investors, pension funds, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think they can survive periods like that again. I think it will be absolutely devastated. And it, it, and it reminds me of something that I said yesterday to Moritz on the podcast, which I just basically saw like the day before or something like that. And that is in Denmark. In Denmark, the Financial Supervisory Authority came out not this week, but the week before, saying that the maximum, the maximum guaranteed rate you can now give on a pension plan is minus 0.5%. So now you are guaranteed to lose money on your pension unless you link it to market risk and you can get maybe hopefully some more, but you also have the risk that your pension in a 60-40 meltdown loses you 40-50%, right? That to me is scary. The whole pension problem is, is is something that's worth a whole separate conversation. But the 60-40 is a uh, base portfolio. And what is the correlation between stocks and bonds is fundamental to what's going to happen to people's portfolio perception of asset allocation. And what you find out is this is that, uh, that uh, you go back to the last 20 years is that the correlation between stocks and bonds was positive. And it has to do with inflation. If you have higher inflation that is related to supply shocks, and uh, then you're going to have this positive correlation between stocks and bonds. But that has a real impact on how people will perceive. You've been put in the complacency that you believe that bonds will always be the safe asset. And yet right now, they're not the safe asset. And it's even worse because when we were talking a little bit earlier, is is that we've seen the yield increase, but people forget that all of the durations of the portfolios of bonds they hold have lengthened out because yields have come down. Bonds are now more sensitive to any change in interest rate than what we've had before. So if you look at what will happen to the price uh, effect of that 100 basis point increase in the 10 year, it's a lot larger than what we saw from a 100 basis point uh, increase if we were at a 5% level because you don't have the carry 
which is a cushion, the coupon that serves as a cushion for your portfolio and reduces the overall duration of, the, of your risk. And the credit risk. On top of that, people have moved on to lower credit to, again, enhance their yield, which we also know is has much higher equity beta if things go down. So it'll be interesting. Credit, we... we... We don't have to worry about credit risk because we're 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 on a glide path to six and a half percent GDP, and, and then we're going to hit the long term. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot yes. about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Of course, everything is fine. Yes. By the way, so don't so, don't pay attention to what we're saying. Today well, at all. an interesting part about the and and put this in perspective is is that I was doing some research and and currency markets, and we were looking at uh, there's a uh, some work that was done from a professor over at. Vienna Business School. And I, I would be surprisingly, there's a lot of good research coming out of the business schools and, and economics departments in Europe you know, relative to the U.S. right now. But but what he did is, is that he looked at FX forecasts for for probably the longest period we, 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 I've seen and across the most currencies. And there's always been what we call this, this is that the, the Mies Rogoff puzzle. This is that fundamentals or forecast have actually done very poorly at being able to forecast exchange rates, and and we knew this back in the early '80s. And one would think is is that over the last three decades, is that our ability to forecast exchange rates would have gotten a lot better. You could sort of say it was it was poor in the early '80s because we were only a decade or so outside of you know, Bretton Woods. We still were trying to get an idea of how flexible exchange rates work. And he's found out is, is that the poor forecasting ability is no better than what we saw in, in prior studies. We still be, be, have biases in our forecast. The best forecast tool is probably a random walk. So the best forecast of an exchange rate for tomorrow or three months ahead or six months ahead is whatever the exchange rate is today. So surprisingly, our ability to forecast phenomena is not improved given all of our excess knowledge. Now, we'll say everybody has gotten better, so you know we may not expect that, that forecasts could get better, but we're no better than we were 30 years ago at being able to forecast a lot of key financial markets. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you brought up another point that you wanted to talk about, and that is when you distinguish between complicated and complex systems. And it was quite interesting. Uh, you mentioned business schools in Europe. I uh, was invited to do uh, a presentation on trend following for London Business School this week. And so I had to do kind of a presentation about trend following its origins and all of that stuff and, and what are the, some of the core beliefs we have and, and, and what are the things that we really care about. And of course, when you look at those things, you think, wow, trend following is pretty simple, right? I mean, there's a very few things that we really focus on, you know, position size and entries and exits and all that stuff. But of course, we know it's not as simple as that. So uh, I'm curious to hear about your uh, thoughts on complicated versus complex systems. Well, this has been an ongoing issue is, is that how do you use information, come up with better forecasts? What should be your philosophy for dealing with markets? And in some sense, we'll, we could. Uh, I'll, I'll end this with how I feel, see trend following fit in. But when you think about markets, is that you could describe them as either complicated or complex. And when you think of a system being complex, it may have many different components. It's hard to understand because of a lot of things going on. You've got Fed, you've got fiscal policy, you've got market behavior. But in some sense, everything has a well-defined role, okay? Think of a car engine. A car engine is a very complicated system because it has a lot of components that all work together to make the engine run. But let me put it this way. It has order. It is understandable. It's linear. If I put all, I could take apart the entire engine. I put, lay out all the parts. There could be a thousand parts but I can put it all back together again and I can get the engine to work, okay? Uh, that it is difficult, but is knowable. It may take special skill, but it is still knowable and it can be understood. A complex system, you could say, if I take it apart, 
I don't know whether I, if I put it back together again, it's going to work in the same way. The relationships are constantly changing between the components. And in, so, in some sense, it's, it's a nonlinear system in the sense is that if I tweak something to the system, I don't know what the response will be. There might be undefined outcome. There will be less order. It may be unpredictable. And a perfect example would be is, is that when we have Chairman Powell speak this week, we'll say that he's a policy engineer. He is telling us, I have a complicated system, but we have a forecast for inflation. We have a forecast for growth. We know exactly what will happen in a year and a half. We know that uh, we can keep interest rates low until 2023, mid-year, and we'll be able to hit this path. Okay. Now, in reality, is, is that that's, it's a complicated system, but he's saying this is that we know what the linear outcomes could be. I would say that the world is, is much more complex and that we don't know what the outcomes would be. We don't know what the response has been. This is that, that Chairman Powell said, said, I want to calm the markets and I'm going to give them a forecast and I'm going to give forward guidance. And what, what was the reaction? Bonds sold off. So, so rates rose. So is that what he expected from his comments? I don't think so. So the world is a is a complex system. So now the question is, how do you deal with a complex system versus a complicated system? If you think the world is complicated, this is that it's just a matter of, I, I got I to gotta go out and hire more people, get more data, and I could be able to figure it out. Okay, I, there's a solution. If it's a complex system, I can say, I don't know what the reaction is going to be. I may have to actually sort of, instead of trying to come up with a complicated response, maybe a simple approach could be better. A simple approach could be able to say, in a complex system, I don't know if whether I'll know how all of the components work. Therefore, I'm going to key in on some components because those might be more important to the others. And I'll use those as guides to tell me what I could do. For a trend follower, it could be following price because in a complex system, there may be conflicting beliefs and some parts are unknowable. I will just follow the prices. Others would sort of say, okay, in a complex system, I'm going to follow surprise announcements or I'm going to follow key economic data. One may not be better than another, but it's a different way of grappling with the issue of complexity. And I would sort of say that uh, if you believe that markets are complex, then you have to ex accept that it's not knowable. If it is not knowable, then what you have to try to do is you have to try to create some safety nets. And one safety net could be is that if prices go down, I get out. So I... I don't try to sort of say, well, it's going down, but I know what the world is going to do. I think it's going to mean revert. So therefore, I should double up my position <laughs> because I know that it's complicated, but I've I've figured out exactly all the components. Now, that doesn't mean that mean reverters can't make money. It just means this is that they have a different view on this complicated versus complex. They say, I think I've cracked the code. And it's complicated, but I've I can figure this out. A complex person said, "I'm humble before markets. Therefore, I got to sort of look for something simpler to try to solve the problem." And I think that a lot of people would agree that financial markets and and the world is a complex playground. And I also believe that to some extent that is why a simpler approach, like trend following, works and continues to work even after five decades of where we have managers who've been around for 50 years like like Don and other a few others right so that that would be my gut feel that this is partly why it works is because we've chosen a a, a more simple approach to to deal with a complex world but this is also why I'm kind of not really sure how I feel about AI in all of this because you're so, so suddenly you're doing something that to me at least seems pretty complex, but you're applying it to a complex world. And is everything then just getting a little bit too complex for it to work? 
even though I think a lot of people think that AI will be kind of the shiny knight that will come and 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 solve all our problems with with these things and just make money for us endlessly, and and I'm not so sure. Well, you know, I, and I think that the I can believe that the world is complex, but I could still be able to say that I want to explore different techniques to try to either control or reduce the complexity. Because if it's complex, it's also complicated. I could be able to use AI to help me understand some of the complications in this complex world. In some senses, is that there's a uh, we're always in an area of gray, and I, I could sort of say that uh, AI has has done some great advancements. I think that it, it there are some great things it's been able to do, and I think that we learn a lot of information. But at the same time, is is that even if you use AI, you say that we're still going to be prone to errors. There still may need a certain level of intuition. You will sort of say that our ability to sort of focus or respond to sort of certain events and uh, almost having a, this uh, discussion is, is that, that I think the last time we talked about it, you know, I'm, I'm always talk about that we live in a VUCA world. Okay. So, Another way to, yep. uh, which, which if you weren't in our last call, we talked is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, this came out of the U.S. War College. So, and when you look at Army decision makers, they are always trying to deal with what some people would call the, the fog of war. Okay. And this is coming, you know, although he didn't use this exact term, von Clausewitz, the 19th century strategist. Is, uh, so, We'll sort of say that there's a there's always a lack of clarity in a battlefield because so many things are going on that it's hard to figure out what you should do if you want to call it the fog. The similar is what we sort of see in the marketplace. This is that what is the fog that we see and how do we sort of reduce the fog? It could be by simply taking a trend. It could be by using AI. But different people might have different approaches on how to deal with the fog. And a perfect example, I think we talked a little, you mentioned earlier about the SLR, the supplemental ratios. And the SLR is that some economists uh, said it's not going to have any effect whatsoever. It's because it has, uh, there's only a few banks that are affected by this. And there are other ratios that are going to have more binding. And so it, it we, we should have no impact whatsoever. And other economists looked at the exact same data, they said, well, this is going to have a real big impact on, on banks and, and on their and balance sheets. So, so so after the SLR was announced, Bank of America, JP Morgan, all down 1% and more. Okay, Now, this could bounce back that on, on Monday, but this is the, we'll call it the fog of markets. This is that you have a group of people who are all very smart, who are getting paid to look at the forecasts here. <laughs> They're saying this is that ah, it's going to have no effect. Other groups are saying this is going to have a real effect on banks, and 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 we now sort of have initial reaction, but we don't know how this is going to play out. We do know that in a we'll call it the fog of market war in a VUCA environment, if you change policy twelve days before the uh, it's supposed to be renewed on March thirty first, it will have an impact because it adds uncertainty to the markets. It is a complexity because you changed now the uh, leverage ratios. It's going to have an impact on market. Since we don't know who's all getting affected, it's ambiguous and it will create volatility. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, the another thing you brought up as a talking point was robot systematic versus human discretionary. Can you tell the difference? So I'm also yep. interested in where you're going to go with that one. Well, we could go on the uh, on the uh, on this intuition and uh, von Clausewitz. I will sort of say that trying to read the original work is uh, is uh, you know if if you ever want to sort of put yourself through some pain, read 19th century German authors in translation. Uh, <laughs> that, that'll that'll do you in. Uh, that is a complex system. But one of the things that I, I, you know, I mentioned and you know, I wrote about because it was a amusing I had is is, is that uh, we've been doing uh, doing some work on due diligence and you know I worked with Kaya on, on uh, their due diligence survey that they re re recently uh, published and I sort of actually had an interesting question 
is that if no one told you what type of manager he was, so so if someone said, okay, I'm not going to tell you whether I'm a systematic, I'm not going to tell you whether you're a trend follower, I'm not going to tell you I'm a fundamentalist, okay, could you, by looking at their numbers or by asking them a few questions, so you can't ask them whether they're a trend follower, you can't ask them if you're a systematic, could you be able to distinguish the systematic manager from the discretionary manager without asking them that direct question? Or could you look at their performance and be able to say what type of manager he is? And this gets back down to one of the old tests. Can you determine someone whether it's a person or a robot behind the screen? So it's a, a the Turing test. If you go back to uh, Isaac Asimov, a uh, science fiction writer, he wrote about the iRobot. And then it's an interesting story is, is that there was someone who was running for election for mayor and uh, someone accused him of being a robot. So if he had a robo-psychologist, how would he determine whether this candidate was a human being or a robot? Who knows, we could be better off if it was the robot. <laughs> but when you think about it, this is, is that and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'll ask you, is that what question could you ask to determine whether the manager was a systematic manager, let's say a robot, versus a discretionary manager? How would you, how would you determine that, to separate those two? Well, now you are putting me on the spot, Mark, here, but, and I don't know if I'm completely off what you're allowed to ask, but maybe I would just ask, what is the reason behind you getting into a position? I'm not asking whether you're systematic or, or, or dis discretionary. I'm asking what is the reason behind you getting into a position? Right. And let me put it this way. It, let's, it's peel back the onion there. And, and you could sort of say this is that you could have a discretionary person who says, is that, well, I look at a, a chart. You know, I look at what's going on with prices. You know, I follow prices and, you know, use momentum and as one of my inputs. So let's say he doesn't disclose all this. So, well, I do use, if you said, well, do you use price information? Yes, I do. Okay, well, that in itself may not be able to separate the robot from the from the human. And so it's almost they say, well, do you use earnings information? You, a robot could say, yes, I do. I use earnings information. I use price earnings. Yeah. Do you look at inflation forecasts? A robot could say, Yes, I do. Do you uh, adapt to changes in the market? Robert said, yes, I do. But I guess, I mean, again, I, do, I don't want to spoil your spiel, but I mean, when I think about it, and I don't know if you would be allowed to ask the question, but I guess the question would come down to, I imagine, is do you use intuition? And then the question, what is intuition? And what does that mean? <laughs> I know we're at 50 minutes, so so we could spend a lot of time. But that's I was kind of hoping that I was getting closer to the to the, the right question. So you need you need to now unveil the 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 perfect question to tell robots from real human beings. Well, I hate to disappoint the readers. Is, is that I haven't solved the uh, this problem by having a single question. Now, although although intuitions is on the right road, but the problem comes in is is that. Can a robot have intuition versus, right. and, and, and then almost as though that I also said, well, a discretionary trader might be, I could distinguish a, trust, a discretionary trader because he makes mistakes. So a discretionary trader will likely have behavioral biases, while I could train a robot not to have behavioral biases, or at least I could... He could have behavioral biases, but I sort of program them in or out. So I sort of started asking the question, well, let's look at the perf his performance. If let's say that he makes uh, mistakes, is that the distinguishing characteristic of a discretionary trader versus a robot? Now, I'm not saying to say that there's an answer, but... I'd like to believe that in a podcast, you want to try to sort of get people to stretch their knowledge base or stretch their thinking. So <laughs> I would love to have some of your uh, listeners actually come out and say, what would be your touring test? So maybe that is the question for the week. People <laughs> should reply to your Twitter handle, my Twitter handle. And, and the question is, how do you tell by asking one question, the difference between a systematic and a discretionary trader. That could be an interesting little challenge. Right. And 
let me put this way, is, is that it may be obvious this is where the problem comes in, is because we'll sort of say that some of the best discretionary traders may be very rule-bound. So if you ask a very good trader and you ask even, let's say, Warren Buffett or some of the great discretionary traders, do they have a system? They probably would sort of say, yes, I follow a certain set of rules and my success was based on the fact that I follow rules. Now, yeah. our ability, if you sort of say old artificial intelligence said, old artificial intelligence was, we'll say, expert system based. So the idea would be is, is that if I was a AI person, an expert system, and I, you were a great trader, Niels, I would stand uh, behind you or sit next to you. I would jot down all the rules you use. And then I would yeah. program that up in a computer. Yeah. And what you find out from our uh, past is that that really wasn't that effective. A expert system type of AI was not able to work that well for traders. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, let's just do a couple more points and we have a couple of questions we want to get to as well. So I think we've done most of the things we thought we were going to do, but maybe correlation and volatility might be an interesting thing to uh, to touch on as well as maybe intraday trends, uh, stable, unstable. What are your thoughts? Well, the interesting part is, is, is that uh, we had our great March madness of last year. Volatility increased, and, and everyone saw that correlations moved to one. And now, we knew that, that that happens at the extremes. At the extremes, this is that, uh, that you know, the sort of story, oh, high volatility, correlation to one. That's a mantra that most people believe. But what happens in the, in the in-between? So, for example, we have the VIX now higher than what we've had it before, but what should if the of uh, VIX goes from you know current levels to up to higher twenties? What's going to happen to correlation? What's going to happen to relationships across markets? And when you think about anyone who's building a system, trend following and non-trend following, you have to sort of account for what is the correlation across markets. That's uh, cross asset correlations is where you make a lot of your money or you face your biggest risks. And so that relationship between correlation and volatility, it is positive, but how do you sort of measure and how do you look at that is probably one of the bigger challenges that I think we're going to see, see faced in the, in the coming months because we're going to expect that these correlations are changed. It goes back to this stock bond correlation thing. Is that one of the issues that's going to ha have to deal with is, is, is that, well, we have higher inflation, which should be positive to stock bond correlation at the same time if we have higher volatility what does that do is is that that should increase the value of safety so it should go back the other way so i think that this is one of the areas that, that is a focus of research and a focus where you know i'm trying to spend my time yeah and i think actually just to add to that i think it's a really important topic and i think 2020 and certainly q1 2020 was a year that or a period that really tested some of the frameworks that we have been working on in our research as an industry because we know that the two key components in most CTA trend following risk management systems is correlation and is volatility. Now, some people don't pay attention to correlation and actually don't pay attention to volatility after the trade has been put on. So changes in volatility, changes in correlation means nothing to that. That's kind of the old turtle way, right, uh, in a sense. And that's also how my own trend-following model works, right? It actually does not matter what happens after the trade has been put on. But we also know there's a lot of managers who, you know, including what we do at Don, where, you no, know, these things uh, is an active component. And it was quite interesting, and I think a lot of the, the return dispersion that took place last year or showed up last year was definitely driven by how you handled this period, because on one hand, you you could say, well, you needed to react quickly 
to lower your risk initially, but then you also need to act quickly to improve or to in increase your risk afterwards, which of course a lot of systems didn't do. And 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 so because your volatility input became you know quite important for the next six months or whatever the period is that you're using uh, in terms of your your input. So I agree with you. It's it's an it's a very interesting topic, and I think it's still one of those areas where we may be able to find small improvements within trend following. Right, and and I think that the whole volatility issue when you sort of say should I look at volatility going forward, we have been trained to view volatility always as a bad thing. You know, it's almost, <laughs> if I say, you're facing volatility, the, your first response is, oh my God, I have to mitigate it. And when you actually look at that, the volatility, because it's deviations from the mean, they could either be positive, so you could have positive volatility, you could have negative volatility, volatility that are negative to the mean. This is that what, a trend follower who doesn't adjust his position says to some degree is, is, is that there's such a thing as good volatility. I want to take advantage of good volatility and I will put a stop in to mitigate bad volatility. So someone who says that I adjust positions based on volatility will sort of say, I am not sure uh, this could be good or could be bad, but it has an impact on what my risk I'm going to be facing. And I want to adjust my risk exposure, regardless of whether there could be good or bad volatility. So when you think about it, if you unpacked, you know, the thinking of volatility is, is that the person who doesn't change his position says, says this is that I want to have good volatility, the positive volatility. I want to have, you know, the uh, deviates that are above the mean. Those are opportunities that I want to exploit. And I will do other things to mitigate the deviations that are below the mean. And so so I can I can take more volatility because I have this mitigation as part of my system. A person who sort of says, is it, well, I'm not sure what's going to happen here, so I think I really just want to sort of say that, and I'm not even sure whether I can mitigate that risk, so therefore I'm going to adjust my position, and I'm going to adjust it down. So you have to really unpack what they're thinking, and I don't want to go back, but this is the whole idea of complex versus you know, complicated system again, is, is that you right. could sort of say, uh, an engineer could say, I'm going to have a complicated system but because I can know what's going to happen, and so I'm going to sort of, you know, sort of have different components to deal with this. Uh, you know, someone who's uh, a complex system could say, like, well, uh, I got to either keep it simple or I have to do something else to mitigate this because it's complex and I don't know what the reaction will be. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to come back to this topic uh, many times. I'm going to jump to questions just because in the interest of, of time, um, we got three questions uh, from Mike, Andy, and Craig. And this, uh, I think there, a lot of it is to do do with sort of system design and all of that. So you need to put your, uh, your okay. that hat on. My, Mark, you, you wear many hats, but this is one of them. So Mike is asking, since one of the core principles of trend following is let profits run and cut losses short, how useful do you find capture ratios as part of performance analysis. I, I just missed that. Which ratios? Capture ratios, meaning up capture, down capture ratios. This has been a, uh, it's actually, this is a large Pandora's box uh, this is a, of, of what you could do. This is, this is it. Uh, because I guess this is it. So let's assume that I have a system and let's say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trend following system. It gets me along the market you start to get profits, profits, profits. But you know now the difference between the current price and your, uh, let's say, a simplest moving average, that gap gets very large, okay? So right away, you're, you know, some reaction would say, well, that la gap is so large, I've got to do something about it. This is I should take my profits because eventually it's going to mean revert to the moving average. The moving average is going to catch up to it in there. And it may be, it, the only way it can catch up is prices have to come down, so uh, so I should actually if that if that gap between price and my moving average gets to a certain level, I should sort of take some profits. And others say like, well, I don't. You could sort of say I don't have enough information to make a judgment about whether there is a definitive gap. Hence, I should just let it run and and 
at the end of the day is, is that I could give back half my profits, but it could still be a profitable trade and I should be able to live with that. So part of this has to do with uh, what we'll call it. Have you looked at and have you explored in terms of just from us say what will happen to the gap versus your system? Where are your stops of exiting? And, and I think that you capture this well when you always talk about it at the beginning of our the podcast about well what happens if all of, you know, all of my stops gets breached you know what is the what is the risk that I'm facing yeah one one of the things that I've always found and 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 there's so many ways meaning there aren't that many ways you do trend following really and so the key question becomes how can we improve trend following and I've always had this sort of um view, I guess. And that is that one of the ways is to be better at capturing the trend. I've always felt that 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 is. And so what does that mean in practice? And for me, it's meant that I thought that if we can improve our exits, we might actually be able to improve our returns and and our, our drawdowns. And so even though I agree when Jerry says, yeah, well, entry is the most important thing because we need to get into the trend. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, we need to get into the trend. But I've always felt that if you could find a way to really improve your exit, which is something I think we did well at Don seven, eight years ago, that was one of the major improvements we made. I do think that's how we kind of improve because I've always felt that identifying a trend is pretty simple. You can almost do it with the naked eye, right? Just look at a chart and say, yeah, that's where the trend began. So all of us are looking for whether it's a moving average crossover or a breakout of some sort. Yeah, we're always going. we almost all of us going to get into the trend more or less at the same time. I know it's grossly over right. or over-exaggerated, but more or less. But we're going to get out at different times. And so for me, of course, you could say, well, how much do you risk and all of that? Yeah, sure. That's going to have an impact as well. So capture ratios. And I do, of course, uh, to to uh, back to the question from, from Mike, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of performance analysis, you do look at how well did you do when, say, the stock gen trend index went up? I mean, were you good at capturing that? And how well did you do to not lose as much money when the stock gen trend index go down. So yeah, in in general analysis, but if you dig into the systems and you look at the designs and which is also what I I try to explain to some extent inside the uh, episode, I think 120, when I went through the design design process of, of, of my own trend following model, trying to do things a little bit differently, using different ways of moving your stops and having different group of models so you don't do the same thing uh, just uh, across uh, every market but just varying the time frame or the volatility sensitivity or whatever it might be but doing really different things overall hopefully you were able to capture more of the trend so i've always so for me the question is interesting because i do think how we capture trends is still something that is somewhat individual to firms how we get into trends i think is much more Uniform. Well, to, to add a complexity, is, this is that, yes. Oh, yeah. Why not? Getting into the trends, a lot of people can do that. And uh, in some sense, getting out of the trends is, uh, I think, a much more difficult problem. Okay. Because you say, like, well, how much of that upside of a capture I'm going to take? When do I get out? But there's a third wrinkle that, that you also have to say is, is that, well, when do I get back into that same market? So, yeah, so sure. which is just as uh, is difficult. So, let's say I'm looking at uh, let's say looking at an oil trend. Oil trend goes up, you know, and I look at my uh, uh, capture or potential capture. I say, well, I'm going to take my uh, take some profits. Okay, so I exit. Okay, price is still above my um, you know moving average. So, do I then say, okay, well, I'm just going to sit out here? And I could sit out here and sit out here and I could sort of find a situation where I could not be in in the market for a very long time. Some people say, well, but that's no problem. I, I don't, I'll just have to wait until the price goes below the, you know, moving average again, if I take my simple system. But is that what you really want? Uh, is, is, is that, are you willing to accept that part of, uh, you know, capture? And 
One thing that you always find is even when we talk about uh, you know you know stop stop activity stop activity is this is that uh, when you think about that is is a, a stop is is a rule that's almost outside the system itself. It doesn't really tell you per se is is that entry or exit. It's it's almost like it's a break. It's a break that says okay somehow something's going wrong and I got to get out of the market because I got to take a timeout. So when you think about, and I've seen some um, some mathematicians look at uh, it, at stop management, and and what they say it's actually when you look at some of the mathematics behind it, it's always suboptimal in the sense is that you, you can always come up with an optimal rule to get in and get out of trades for you know if you if it follows certain types of random process with drift is that adding stops is always suboptimal. Okay. Yet we all do it because we sort of say that it's a it's a break system to get us out when we say I don't know. What you're saying is, is that a it's not that the model is broken, but right now my model does not know what to do properly. So it's good for me to sort of say I will take my losses and reassess all my profit. Right? I mean, yeah, if, yeah. And 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 actually, I mean, it's it's really interesting because there's a very good example about this week. So as I said, when I did the run through, I got stopped out, or my trend model got stopped out of a lot of long positions in energy. Right? And I'm pretty sure that. You know, Morris and Jerry, probably nothing happened this week, right? right. I, I don't know, but but I have a feeling, right? And 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 it's so so th- all I'm just trying to say is that how we design some of these key components in the system will determine to a large extent the difference or will explain the difference in performance. So clearly if equity in if if energy markets are gonna scoot up to new highs in the next week, I'm going to be sitting there watching that, not making money from it, right? right? But that's the choice, right? And But if it's going to, you know, crash another $8 uh, on Monday, I'm going to sit there and say, yeah, I'm glad I went out. Well, <laughs> so, oh, the system went out, so to speak. That's just the way it is. Well, going back to our, our discussion earlier about human versus robot, this is clearly the fundamental human component is, is, is that a human has to determine a, the choices of rules that will be placed into a system. And that, that is, call it the intuition. It's based on the philosophy of markets. It's on your philosophy of risk. This is that, that is uniquely discretionary or human. Then the rules come in and, and, and that, that will sort of say, how do I implement that? will sort of say that artificial intelligence will say, yes, I think we can do this because we can be able to, uh, we can use the machines to learn a set of rules and try to pick and choose which ones are better than others. So, so, uh, so others would argue that even a robot could do this, but building the system is, is uniquely human because if you look at your system versus Jerry's system or some other system is, is, is that it embodies his view of the world. Yeah. And it embodies Absolutely. how you sort of feel comfortable with risk and how you feel, uh, how you view, or it it embodies how you want to deal with a fog of markets. It embodies what you want to deal with, VUCA. <laughs> oh, there. So we managed to get VUCA into <laughs> the uh, conversation again, which is great. Yeah. Got to go back to these uh, basic themes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Absolutely. I love it. All right. So moving on. Um, and thanks, by the way, very much for the question, Mike. Andy writes in, thanks for the terrific show, which has worked its way up to one of the few shows I will ensure I make time to listen to each week. So thanks very much for that, Andy. That means a lot. I run a small investment portfolio, which typically includes international equities, options, FX, and at times a limited amount of commodities via futures. Given the high minimums for many CTAs, what do you think about using a CTA ETF, such as the Wisdom Tree Managed Futures Strategy, uh, or one of the many trend-following ETFs? I also like the option to dollar cost average into positions, which also makes the ETF route attractive. Thanks for teaching and your willingness to help us to learn. Good question from Andy. What uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that one of the problems we found is is, is that uh, there are a lot of managed futures managers who said that a route to raising assets has been to go to mutual funds and then to ETFs. And 
unfortunately is that if you look at uh, and I, you know there there has been some research that has looked at mutual fund managed futures type managers their performance they are generally cheaper but they have not performed as well as 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 the uh, uh, private funds and so I'd sort of say that it's a it's a low cost way of doing it you can then dollar cost average but you have to be aware or, or uh, that that you may not be getting the best product and you may not be getting the best managers so there's going to be a performance drag and that performance drag uh, may be greater than whatever the savings you might have by buying some a product that has uh, sort of a, a cheaper cost basis yeah I mean one of the things that is interesting a little bit uh, controversial to some extent when you say it, and that is that low-cost funds are too expensive. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, of course, as you rightly say, that I've seen no evidence that these low-cost funds have been able to match, let alone outperform the performance of the... And they're not even full fees anymore because we've all come down in terms of, of fees to some extent. But to me, the the narrative that these funds managed to raise all those billions of dollars on, the fact that it was just cheap and trend following is so easy that you shouldn't pay more than 50 basis points for it. And where there was no incentive for the manager to do well because they would be paid 50 basis points regardless, there was no performance fee. I think it's completely crazy for investors to put money in a product like that. In, managers need to be incentivized to do better and to do well for their clients. So you should always have a performance fee. Whether or not you have a management fee or not, we don't at done. Uh, we only make money when our clients make money. I think that's incredibly fair, but it doesn't have to be like that. You, you know, I don't mind people having a small management fee as well. I think it's fine. But I do think you could almost make the claim nowadays that these you know, cheap funds are just simply too expensive. And this gets back to how the industry has evolved for wealth managers. So because a lot of wealth managers are now on platforms and the platforms are, it's easy for them to take in data that's that's streaming data from mutual funds, ETFs or individual securities. And then if you, if you buy a private fund, this is it. How do you get that into your, your wealth management reports? And, and, uh, you know, I'd sort of say it's, very fundamental is this is that we and we've talked to RIAs at different times and I'd sort of say it's that's a tough market to deal with. This is like if you have a private fund, how does I get this into my pie chart of allocations for uh, for my clients? Then you also have the issue is this is that so there are other trade offs if you go to private funds depending on what their liquidity constraints you may not have daily liquidity so you might have to uh, you, you may only have liquidity at month end you may have to then give a notice period before you can actually sort of say I'm going to give you notice that I'm going to redeem funds at the end and then I have to wait until after the nav is struck and then I'm going to get my cash back so there's different drags on performance that are structural that impact your return that you would receive from a client that won't show up at the track record. So when do I give notice versus when do I get my cash back? If I had some mutual fund, I, I do I get a superior product or an inferior product? What are the fees that I get versus the performance I have? So there's a lot, lot of questions that are get unpacked that you won't see in just a track record. I agree. And actually, I think there are some differences between how Europe is handling this and how the US is handling this. For example, on the performance fee front, I think it's much harder to charge a performance fee in the US on some of these mutual slash ETF funds. In Europe, we have the usage structure and here you are able to do it. They have some other disadvantages, maybe to some extent. But I think, you know, generally speaking, I think the usage fund structure has allowed a little bit more flexibility, even though nowadays, which is quite interesting actually, nowadays, usage funds is only, are only allowed, starting in this year, to charge a performance fee once a year. It has to be at the end of the year. So that's obviously quite a big disadvantage to managers, especially if they rely on performance fees as their main source of fee, right, and not charge a, a management fee, right? So that, I think, is, is certainly not a, a great thing, um, but, you know, 
I guess with all these things that are regulated by people who are probably not practitioners, it's never going to be a, a good, perfect structure for the investor. But anyways, I want to jump on to the next and final question from Craig. Craig writes, I hope you're doing well. I like the format you guys are doing with a rotation of co-hosts each week. So do I, by the way, Craig. I think it's great. It keeps things very fresh and conversations have been pretty insightful. So thanks for that. I'm currently building API infrastructure to start trend-following cryptocurrency futures on a cryptocurrency exchange. Essentially, I'm taking what I'm already doing on stocks and commodities and applying it to different cryptocurrencies and DeFi tokens available to trade, of which many have only low to moderate correlation to Bitcoin. Lesser known, quote-unquote, small cap cryptocurrencies have seen some extraordinary trends over the last over the past year, a number of them significantly outperforming Bitcoin. My question is, have CTAs missed an opportunity by only staying on traditional futures exchanges where they can only trade Bitcoin and now Ethereum? And do you think CTAs will eventually move on to crypto exchanges once the space has been deemed to have matured enough? Thanks for the question, Craig. I'm going to pass that on to our local expert in cryptocurrencies. Okay, well, I'm not an expert at cryptocurrency, <laughs> but I could sort of say that you can now trade futures on, on the CME. Which so so it's becoming yeah. more mainstream. And I, I think that... But, but I think Craig's point is that there are two futures when you go on exchange, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. Yeah. And what he's seen is, and that's absolutely right, you've seen these massive trends for whatever reason on some of these smaller cryptos. And, and, and I think that this is no different than uh, when you ask uh, a, a trend follower, well, how come you don't uh, trade you know, small cap stocks? And why are you trading, uh, you know, f just futures? It's a choice. I think that the, uh, the market is evolving. I think that people are, are looking at this. And, and I think that the smart managers are saying is, is that we've seen a, just a wild move in crypto. I may have missed that move, but at the same time, is is that a wild move is coming with high volatility? It's not clear. Is is that uh, what will happen in the future? I may need to look at this and explore it some more. And so I think that a lot of managers are showing prudence in how that they sort of dip their toe into this water, which I think is there's nothing wrong with that. It's it's a choice. Yeah, and so the way I see it is that I think. Managers will adopt different markets. So, so I think what's happened in the last couple of years, love to hear your thoughts about this market. And that is, as maybe returns from classical trend following has been under somewhat pressure, not, not the last year or two, because actually 2019 and 2020 for trend followers were pretty okay. But certainly in the last five years overall, there's been a bit of a drought in terms of, of great returns, let's call it that. So managers have done a few different things. But one of the things is that, that a lot more managers have gone to quote-unquote alternative markets, right? And these alternative markets are to be found in smaller commodities, com uh, markets based in China and, and what have you. And of course, then also the cryptos. And there's no doubt that some managers, if you look at their return attribution in the last year or two, a lot of that would have come from Bitcoin, for right. example. And you can say, well, that's a great decision to make. Or some will say, well, hang on, that's just like being lucky. You just picked a market that was lucky. So there's nothing to do about your system. But, you know, I think you can argue it both ways. And to some extent, I think people will continue to expand and try new avenues to to go to um, to the point that, that you raise, uh, Craig, about this. What I will say, though, is... And we touched a little bit upon it last week when we talked about cash management, where uh, Moritz were talking about, you know, you know, certain funds are putting their money into gold as the nomination, and and you could do um, spreads on on some energy exchanges in 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 Europe to to pick up one percent. But my point is that I think we as 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 managers, there are certain things that has to come before just trying to eke out. Uh, a little bit of performance from your cash, for example. I think liquidity and keeping it safe and all of that, that is what we, that is paramount for us as 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 managers, right? So I, I'm not an advocate for putting your cash in gold uh, or, or in, in, in carbon spreads or whatever it is. I really think you need to keep it super safe 
super liquid. If you're your own investor, if you're managing your own money, completely different. You can do whatever you want and that's perfectly fine. But it goes also to this thing about trading these super small markets, which may produce some really interesting returns. And if you're managing your own money, great, that probably will give you a lot of opportunity. But if you're a manager and you are, you are, you know, you have responsibility for other people's money, I do think there are certain risks that we shouldn't take. And one of them, of course, is liquidity and 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 uh, counterparty risk and and things like that. So I th- I feel that a lot of managers will stay on the main exchanges. Maybe more and more markets will go uh, in the crypto space on the main exchanges, even though. And I'm not an expert, even though people will say, "Well, there's some big crypto exchanges, and they're just as good as the CME." I don't know. I have no view on that, but. But I do think that it's 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 a difficult discussion because it's not just about finding markets that can give high returns. There are other considerations we need to take into account when we manage other people's money. Now, this is a question that has been arising for decades. So I, I will because I remember back in the uh, you know late '90s, someone would you'd come up to me, you know, wherever our clients would come up to me and say like. How come you didn't make money in the gold market? The gold market has just been uh, on fire. Uh, look at this trend here. You should have made money. And you said that you made no money or you made little money in gold. It's just that and even uh, in a Ray Dalio, stupid bond markets, anybody who's, anybody could have made money in this. And you try to say like, well, it's more complex than that. We uh, actually build a portfolio. So when you think about it, if there's a, if you put have a 2% allocation in some commodity and it goes up 100%, what's going to be the impact on your portfolio? It's going to be pretty small. This is it. So, uh, and if you look at all the cryptocurrencies and all of those, if any manager says that, well, I my positions are based on volatility. So I look at the uh, you know inverse of volatility. This is that all of those positions in those cryptocurrencies would be very small and so you would even if you had a large move the impact on the overall portfolio would be would be small and when people think about adding new commodities into markets it's it's a uh, a multi decision process okay first do i have enough data on the data so can I be able to then test it back in time second is is that what's the regulatory environment that i have to face Third, what is the volatility? How is it cor- fourth? How is it correlated with other markets? What are the structural impediments for trading? You know, is it easy to trade? Difficult to trade? This is that. What's the liquidity that I'm going to be faced? This is that. Uh, and how's and how do I size based on the liquidity that I'm going to be uh, available in the market? Can I be able to get in? Can I be able to get out? So the choice is not based on just what the chart tells us. There are many different criteria that a good manager uses to determine whether he should put something in the portfolio. And I would sort of say that that it's not that people are adverse to it; is that there is a process. So uh, there, uh, and going back, it could be even robotic. <laughs> so, so, but uh, it could be very discretionary. But there is a process on how to add or subtract markets from a portfolio. Yeah, and on top of that, and I, again, I don't want to make it political. I don't want to make it into a bit big Bitcoin discussion. But again, when I listen to some of the people uh, out there that maybe not necessarily fully into the whole crypto space, it's because they also cite other types of risk, political risks, such as what we've seen in India, where they just banned, as far as I understand. And Bitcoin or cryptos, and uh, which have they've also done in other places. So there are many things to take into account. I think where you are based, Craig, I don't think that's necessarily something you need to worry about uh, tomorrow. But I think Mark is absolutely right. You need to look at all of the risks involved in doing so. So yeah, hopefully that was useful. And thanks for all of the questions that came in today. Let me run through some of the performance data we've seen as of Thursday evening. I think Friday was a Mixed day, that's my kind of gut feel for managers, depending on how you were positioned and how you trade. Um, I think it could have been a little bit of a mixed uh, day on Friday. Anyways, BTOP50 index is still up 1.4% for the month, up three and a quarter for the year. SockGen CT index up almost 2% for the month, up three and a half percent for the year. SockGen trend index 
also up almost 2% for the month, up almost 5% for, for the year. Sok Jen's short-term traders index up about a percent, up 25 for the year. As I mentioned, my trend barometer finished at 45. That's a neutral reading. And then traditional things, MSCI World was, is up 2.5% in March and up 4% or thereabouts uh, for the year. And the World Government Bond Index, in line with what's happening in the US Treasury markets, is down 29 basis points so far in March. I don't know, did you come across any interesting um, blog post, podcast, or anything that you picked up on since we last spoke that you can recommend <laughs> other than your own, of course? And by the way, you should always read Mark's blog post, uh, which I hope you do. So, well, the, the one thing I'm reading in a book about uh, about uh, weirdos. And so, Niels, you and I and most of our readers are, are weird. Western-educated uh in, we come from industrial rich democracies. And what the basically the author is, 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 has been talking about is the fact that a lot of our psychological studies have been based on people who are students or people from you know Western worlds or the weird world. And their behavior is very different than the rest of the world. And when we talk about diversity and we talk about how we, how we interact with other parts of the world and the emerging markets, is, is that we have to accept this, is that, that, that different people from different parts of the world have a different worldview. They're not all weirdos. And that will have an impact on how we invest going forward. I'm not sure exactly how, but I will tell you this, is that it, it's gonna have some impact. So, so I want people to, We'll end with that. This is that we're weird and we're proud of it, but that doesn't mean that that's the way the rest of the world is going to behave. <laughs> well, I think, you know, having spent 30 plus years in the trend following space, I think m many investors think the trend followers are a bit weird. So uh, definitely uh, I can uh, subscribe to that. From my point of view, um, if you like kind of uh, getting a, a view on, on the current state of the, the economic world, I did like the last conversation that uh, Eric Townsend had with Juliet de Klerk over on Macro Voices. I thought that was good. And she's always very well prepared with charts and arguments. So I enjoyed that this week. And um, of course, um, as you would expect me to say, if you have not yet left a rating and review, and we got some great ones, by the way, the last couple of weeks. So I appreciate that. I didn't write down the names of you, but I want to acknowledge all of you who uh, went over to iTunes and left a rating and review. Please continue to do so. They really do help in how we rank on these platforms. So uh, so that's um, that's one of the housekeeping things I want to make sure I, for, I say. Next week, I am joined by Rob, and maybe we need to uh, go back and talk a little bit about his uh, afterthoughts since his epic episode with Jerry a couple of weeks ago. So make sure you get your questions in. Uh, you can email them to info at toptradersonplug.com, and I will do my best to bring them up with Rob. In the meantime, from two weirdos, Mark and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to uh, being back with you next week. In the meantime, be well. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.